Eight commonly believed myths that are not quite true. Number one, I can't be charged with a crime if I was mistaken about the law. Now this is a common myth, but it's not quite true. Whilst a mistake about the law can sometimes act as some kind of mitigation, or it might even dissuade the police from charging you with the crime in the first place. If it's got as far as the CPS, it's probably more serious and a mistake is not likely to cut it. The police, on the other hand, may be swayed if you've just had a simple mistake and you're polite with them and they might just overlook it. However, the law on mistake when it comes to crime is covered extensively throughout common law and is covered within various statutes such as the Criminal Law Act. Number two, I have the absolute right to use any name that I want. This is a bit of a common myth, but it's not entirely true. In England and Wales, you can generally go by whichever name or pseudonym that you wish. So long as you're not being deceptive and fraudulent and you're trying to obtain money or services or anything else by deception when using a false name. Plus, if you are required by the police to provide your name, which you are in certain situations, more on that a little bit later, you are required to use your absolute official name. Also, when entering a contract or something else of this nature, you are then required to use your proper name because you're entering a legal agreement and therefore putting down the wrong name, you might think you're being clever by evading the terms of the contract, whereas instead you might just be committing a criminal offence of fraud. More broadly speaking, the law on using a name is covered extensively throughout common law and in various statutes, including the Identity Documents Act of 2010. Number three, nobody can be arrested for sleep Sleeping rough. This is a bit of a common myth, but is not entirely true. In England and Wales, sleeping rough is not necessarily a criminal offence in and of itself, but the police can use various powers under the Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act of 2014, a very controversial bit of law that allowed the police various powers to move on individuals or even arrest them if they're causing some kind of nuisance or disturbance in a public place. Number four, I can't be charged with a crime if I was acting in self-defence. This is another common myth, but is not entirely true. While self-defence does operate as a defence, and a full defence at that, if it's completely made out, that's all that it is. It's a defence to criminal charges. If you're acting in self-defence, you may well be prosecuted for something that you've done whilst carrying out said self-defence, you may not, again, if you're reasonable with the police and you discuss it with them and you say, I was just acting in self-defense when this guy tried to attack me, rob me, destroy my car, break into my house and so on. But ultimately, if you really hurt that guy for doing any of those things, you may well be prosecuted for assault GBH or even worse. You may still raise the defence of self-defence, that's only an evidential burden on your part and then the burden of proof passes back to the prosecution to disprove that you are acting in self-defence, which is a two-part test, beyond all reasonable doubt. But nonetheless, you can still be charged with the crime if you were even only acting in self-defence. Number five, on a similar theme, I can't be charged with a crime if I was provoked. This is another common myth, but is not entirely true. Provocation is something that the courts, and obviously I mean the jury as well, will take into consideration when considering whether an offence has been committed or not. It's not a defence per se. It acts more like a mitigation of sorts, i.e. if you were provoked into doing something, the jury will be asked to consider to what degree you were provoked to the point that a person of reasonable mind would lose control and act in the way that they did, thus the provocation. But provocation therefore will only be taken into account as a mitigating factor or a partial defence rather than a full defence. An example of this can be found in the Homicide Act of 1957. Number six, I can't be arrested for refusing to provide a specimen of breath. This is another common myth, but is not entirely true. In England and Wales, it is a criminal offence to refuse to provide a specimen of breath, and in fact, it's quite a common one. You can be arrested for it, and although you can't be convicted on the specimen of breath alone, you can certainly be arrested for the offence of refusing to provide a specimen of breath at the roadside. Number seven, I have the absolute right to remain silent in every situation. This is another myth, 
but is not entirely true. Whilst you do have the right to a certain degree to remain silent in certain circumstances, such as being questioned by the police, as per go the police caution, you do not have to say anything, there are certain situations where you will be compelled to provide evidence to the court. For example, if you are summoned to court and required to give evidence. In that situation, it would be contempt of court to refuse to evade the questions if directed to do so by the judge. So you do not have at all times a complete and absolute right to remain silent. Finally, number eight, I can't be fired for posting something on social media outside of my work hours. This is another common myth, but is not entirely true. In fact, this is quite a controversial one because a lot of people think that you have the right to express your opinions and say whatever you wish outside of work, which is generally true with the Article 10 freedom of expression. However, there are certain situations where your employer might decide to take disciplinary action for things that you've said outside of work. If it has a negative impact on the company's reputation, brings the company into disrepute and is potentially against your contract of employment. This is covered relatively extensively in the ACAS Code of Practice on Disciplinary and Grievance Procedures. In other words, if you are caught filming something, saying something, doing something that is derogatory to your company's reputation, you might well see yourself facing disciplinary action and you might see yourself fired for it. My absolute best guidance in those situations are, well, first of all, get some legal advice, but secondly, take contemporaneous notes of everything that happened, everything that was said, when it was said, how it was said, who was present, where you were, how you felt, and all of these kind of things. If you're going through any of those kind of grievance procedures and you're worried about losing your job, or you do lose your job and you're worried that it was unfair and you want to be able to prove that later, my guidance to you would be to sign up for Proofify the app at proofify.app. Join the waitlist and employment is another thing that I've just thought of that is going to be a great idea for this app. So you can document with guidance from me as to what evidence you need, in what format you need it, what information will be useful in a tribunal later. There are lots of different situations where you may need to keep contemporaneous records in a neat little bundle and the app will help to do that for you. So sign up to the waitlist in the description below. Remember to smash that like button and subscribe because 60% of you are still not subscribed to my channel. But in the meantime, thank you for watching.